Hello, this is uh, Mike Douglas, and this is the uh, New Technologies in Mathematics seminar at uh, CMSA in Harvard uh, University. And uh, this week, we're delighted to have uh, Larry Paulson from the uh, Cambridge Computer Lab, one of the uh, foremost researchers in uh, interactive theorem proving systems. And uh, he'll tell us about uh, doing mathematics with uh, simple types. As we uh, always do, I'll remind you that uh, We'll uh, take questions during the talk, and the best way is by uh, chat. I'll read the chat. I can uh, pose a question at an appropriate moment, but then there will also be uh, pauses for questions and time for questions at the end. So uh, with no further ado, uh, Larry, please. OK, thank you for that introduction. Uh, this is joint work with Myrna and Angela Key. OK, so let's begin. Uh, I'd like to begin with this quote. I'm not sure if Dana even agrees with that anymore, but this remark about Russell and Ramsey leading to type theory is at least pithy, if nothing else. And of course, this particular talk is about using simple type theory to formalize mathematics. Um, I should say a little about what simple type theory is. It does indeed date to Russell and Whitehead. Um, well, it wasn't simple then, but Ramsey simplified it and Church formalized it in the form that we know today. That is the type lambda calculus. Um, for Church, types were still, shall we say, I would think Church gave them a very low status. So. In Russell's day, types did not even have a syntax. And for church, I think types were meant to be swept under the carpet and existed only to prevent uh, contradictions. So it was only later with, for example, the rise of functional programming and so on, that people wanted to push types more and more to the fore and give them a more dominant role. So for church, for example, you would perhaps no, you would definitely have a set of natural numbers, not a type of natural numbers, and so on for other things you would construct. Now, these days we do a lot of sophisticated things with types, even in simple type theory. And we have, for example, axiomatic type classes, which you can do a lot of clever things with, but I won't say anything about them here because we're not going to use them. Since most of the activity today has to do with dependent type theories, I feel I ought to put in a word for simple types and to argue that we're not just being backwards. And in fact, I had the immense privilege of meeting with De Bruyne in something like 1976 when he visited Caltech and had some personal sessions with him and became very familiar with Automath. So I am perfectly familiar with the dependent types and their various advantages, and, that, and they are very interesting. So I will not slag them off. Nevertheless, the simple types have advantages too. Um, they are simpler. So as a system builder, it is much simpler to build things that have simple types. Um, that then makes it easier for you to achieve automation. And I have to say there are certain circles in which people disparage automation. I would like to say maybe it is sour grapes, I don't know, but certainly for the kind of work I and my colleagues have been doing, having some brains in the system is very important. Um, now here I'm on shakier ground. I, I've never used a system like COC. I get the impression that sometimes it doesn't do what you like in terms of synthesizing arguments or in terms of type checking, it takes a long time, but I wouldn't hold me to this. Um, it's nice that higher order logic is self-contained. Now, funnily enough for this talk, I do need to extend higher order logic, but for most purposes, what comes out of the box, so to speak, is all you need to do, even things very sophisticated like inductive definitions and very fancy recursive function definitions and so on are all reducible to the base logic. Um, 
and maybe a very important point, extensional equality. Uh, the idea that you cannot tell whether a thing is a definition or an equality that you proved perhaps with a thousand pages of formal proof is I think a crucial advantage of simply typed systems. I would say, and of course, the, the work I'm presenting today is just a case study like so many of them, but there is a key scientific question that I think we are all interested in that is exactly this, the respective merits of simple types versus dependent types, which one is better suited for one thing than another. And I will simply say today that it would not be right simply to say, ah, oh, simple types is some backward thing that will definitely be superseded because I don't think it looks like that. Before I go into any more detail, I think maybe I should address the question of whether this can be done at all because it keeps coming up again. Over and over again, the same points are being made. So, and I love this thing that one plus one equals two is paged is proved on page 362. And actually, if you have Principia Mathematica, I have the paperback edition. There is a footnote. It's not actually one plus one equals two that is proved, but rather they say with suitable definitions, it is equivalent to one plus one equals two. Um, the answer to this is you don't have to do it the way they did it. Another point some people really push is that Gödel's theorem proved it's impossible. This does not make any sense. So we are not in the 19th century. One of the remarkable facts about the 19th century was a lot of, a lot of people were using the axiom of choice but they didn't know they were assuming anything. It didn't have a name. And when Zermilo wrote it down and gave it a name, some of these people rejected it very fervently, even though their own work depended on it, absolutely. People like LeBeg and Baer. I think today, I mean, in principle, that could happen again, that some mathematics could be done with maybe an, an assumption that nobody noticed. But that has nothing to do with incompleteness. What I'm trying to say in this roundabout way is that if there is some gap in our axiom system that has to do with incompleteness, that is causing a thing we want to prove to be not provable, then this deficiency of the axioms will be evident to the mathematicians already, even before we formalize it. Or at worst, in formalizing it, we will discover the uh, overlooked assumption. Uh, the last thing you see is, uh, objection you see, is simply that automated proof is undecidable. And that's all right. We are not trying to replace mathematicians altogether. And I think most mathematicians would be very depressed if we found a way of getting rid of their subject altogether. Okay, now I just have just to prove my point now empirically, to list some things that was done. Um, this was all done in Isabel Hall, although to be quite honest, I stole mo most of it from Hall Light. So here they are, Jordan Curve, Central, ah, that's Jeremy, Jeremy's in the audience. Jeremy did the Central Limit Theorem, Residue Theorem, I think that is Wenda who is here, Prime Number Theorem, a bunch of people did these things. Um, that one was done very recently by a former intern of mine. Uh, this one is cheating because mostly it was done in Hall Light, but that is still simple type theory. So it's still buttressing the claim of what you can do in simple type theory. But a bit of this um, fly spec work was done in Isabel, in fact. Now the green boxes refer to whole theories as opposed to theorems. And again, there are a lot of really quite advanced things have been done already. I don't really need to talk about all of them in any detail, just to point out, we can do serious mathematics. 
So if you like, the, the question perhaps is, should we be doing even more? Okay, now for people who haven't come across Isabel, I don't want to go through every one of these. You can read the slide. <clears throat> we'll depend very heavily on the automation. These structured proofs you'll see in the forthcoming uh, examples, I will show you some fragments of proofs. So you can see that it is possible to read a formal proof. And I think that's very important. We can also convert them into LaTeX um, and so on. I suppose I should mention that the structured language was kind of ripped off from the Mesar system. Okay, wait a moment. Sorry, there we are. So, but my particular example today is in set theory. How can we do set theory in higher order logic? Turns out it is way too weak. So it's even weaker than Zermilo, let alone zermilo Frankel set theory. But there is a simple remedy, which is to throw in these ZF axioms. It may look a little ugly to take higher order logic, which is already a fully fledged framework for doing mathematics and simply throw in the ZF axioms. But it's possible to do it in a very nice way. I won't go into the details here. Um, we have, by the way, the axiom of choice already. We can set things up so that we can reuse a lot of the stuff done in higher order logic. So for example, we have a construction of the real higher order logic. And by doing a couple of clever things, we can establish a theorem that this type of the real numbers corresponds to an element of the Zermila Frankel universe. Um, and I think it's actually rather cool that it's done with very little effort. You certainly wouldn't want to have to redo the construction of the reals in ZF. So all the stuff we've already got can be, if you like, mirrored in our ZF universe that we just created. Uh, we can also reuse things like recursion principles done in higher order logic, immediately give us transfinite recursion in set theory. So that's all very nice. Um, and so we can use that to develop uh, Cantor's paradise order types and ordinals and all those things can then be done in this augmented higher order logic. Okay, I guess now it's time to move into the meat of the talk. I always get a little scared here because this is not really my subject, but this is what the talk is about. These generalizations of Ramsey properties, um, it gets super technical and really no one needs to follow any proofs in detail and indeed no proofs are given in detail, but I give enough bits of pieces of real proofs, that is textbook proofs, followed by formal proofs just to try and give a flavor of what happens when you do this. So this partition notation has to do with generalizations or general Ramsey properties where alpha is sort of your input a beta and gamma are kind of outputs. They're all ordinals in this particular framework we're doing, set theoretic ordinals. And as it says on the slide, the meaning of that arrow notation up there is you imagine you've got your ordinal alpha, consider all of its n element sets where n is a finite number, actually n equals two for the rest of the talk. Um, imagine these n element sets colored with either two colors, let's say, I don't know, red and blue, say. Um, and what the arrow notation says is that either there is a subset of alpha of type beta and all the n sets, the n element sets are colored with blue, or there is another set of type gamma and all the n sets are colored red. So in particular, uh, if you know the infinite Ramsey theorem, then it can be expressed uh, as shown there with the arrow notation. 
Uh, and here I'm using the fact throughout that ordinals are in fact sets. So what is the Erdős problem? And now, as I said, e n now equals two, and we're only interested now in unordered pairs for the rest of the talk. Um, the first arrow thing there, the first partition claim is trivial because for the case of alpha and two, um, if there are no two element, if there, if you can't find two elements of alpha that are colored red, then all the elements, all the pairs of them are colored blue, in which case you trivially get alpha. So that case is trivial. The one in red fails. I won't give the counterexample, although it is relatively simple. So the interesting question, at least Erdos said, we need to find out, um, as it shows here, alpha arrow alpha three, for which alphas? And Erdos was interested enough in this question to offer a prize of $1,000, which I guess was a lot of money back then. And anyway, it was out of his own pocket. So yeah, he was interested in that. Um, So what we did for this particular project I'm reporting here are the following instances of Erdős's um, problem. See the first one there, which is originally due to Specker, and then that one in the middle, which I don't even want to try to read, and then the final one with omega to the omega. And in fact, in order to get so far, we had to do a lot of other stuff like the th Cantor normal form, which is a fairly straightforward thing in set theory, um, a theorem, this so-called Nash-Williams partition theorem. And then the annoying thing, so I don't know how familiar people are with ordered types, um, which are a way of measuring well orderings using ordinals. My impression from reading proofs is the assumption seems to be made that all properties of order types are trivial. I don't think they're trivial at all. And I often had to work incredibly hard to prove that a particular uh, relation had the order type that they claimed that it had. And I wasn't even aware of a nice little toolkit of lemmas to help you do this. So all of that was additional work kind of built into this project. So let's begin. Actually, in fact, most of the rest of the talk, I'll be talking about formalizing a paper by Erdős and Milner. Then towards the end, I will go to the other paper containing the main result, and that paper is by Larson. So Erdős and Milner proved this partition relation thing shown in the blue box. Um, this is ordinal arithmetic, by the way. So omega to the one plus alpha n. Alpha is an ordinal. Um, everyone knows, I hope, that ordinal addition is not commutative. So you can't turn it around and say plus one. Um, anyway, as it says in the green box, They've known, they knew the result for a long time. Now, if I may be allowed a snarky remark here. So their paper was five pages long. Um, a couple of years after it appeared, a, a errata paper appeared that was one full page long, or if you like, 20% as long as the original paper. And here is one page from the original paper in which the highlighted material is all wrong. And in fact, I think on the following page, uh, all of that material is also wrong, which means effectively the entire proof of the main lemma was wrong. And this was Erdős. And the other author was the guy who discovered this in the first place. Um, now, again, I'm not trying to impugn the reputations of these people, just to point out how difficult this work is and how there is value sometimes in 
formalizing this work so I can definitely say this is a theorem, at least the special case that I considered, having pushed it through uh, Isabel. Okay, so as I mentioned, I will go through just the highlights. So they make a claim. Now, I don't even want to say what a strong type is. I mean, it will be on the slide, but this is one of the claims. Um, and that took 200 lines. They made a little remark. I think it was a two line remark that took 72 lines to formalize. Then the main proof, the one that had all the errors in it, uh, see that was nearly a thousand lines. And I can tell you that was tough. Partly it was tough because I don't really understand this just to be honest with you, I had, again, the privilege at Caltech of learning set theory from Alexander Kekris. Um, and I think I learned a lot. We didn't do anything on this particular subject matter, however. I don't even think we had inf the infinite uh, Ramsey theorem. And we had little of anything about order type. So this is not anything I really know a lot about. Then the main theorem turns out to be a, a straightforward induction. And finally, there's a thing that Larson needed for her own paper, which I proved as part of this. And it was relatively simple as well. So the first step in the proof then, every ordinal is a strong type. What are we talking about here? Well, this is the definition of strong type. I'm not expecting anyone to make any sense of it, but you can see it is four lines. Um, I don't even, I think this has something to do with Cantor normal form, but I've forgotten. Anyway, so this formalization turned into 200 lines of which there is the beginning. The reason I'm showing you this is just to give you an idea of what the code looks like. You can see, um, for example, the second line that says D is basically says D is a subset of the ordinal beta. This ELTS means elements, and let's say it's needed for technical reasons. So D is a subset of the ordinal beta, um, and this theorem yields some L with the properties shown there. Um, so L will be a finite sequence of God knows what things that have their order type is an indecomposable ordinal and so on and so on and so on. Again, um, Please don't ask for any details because although I formalize this, I then managed to forget it almost completely. This is the remark. I believe the remark, okay, I typed it myself this time, but I think this remark was made with no explanation at all. Um, and it's one of these sort of obvious remarks um, the 72 lines that it came into were, I think, not too difficult to do. Nevertheless, one resents having to write so much, but you have to figure out. So you've got these two sets. They both got order type alpha. Alpha is a so-called indecomposable ordinal. And indecomposable somehow means that if you break it into a smaller... I don't even remember exactly. Um, yeah, you said shows you how quickly I lost the knowledge I had when formalizing this. Um, so this was, however, a fairly routine calculation. Nevertheless, one might resent having to do so much work in order to show it. Okay, now here is the really hard technical lemma, which took a thousand lines to prove. And it says is um, the ordinal alpha times beta um, goes to 
Now, this funny thing with the intersection symbol, that should be read as minimum. So the smaller of the ordinals gamma or omega times beta is the first ordinal there. And the other is 2k, which is a finite ordinal. So that partition relation holds provided alpha arrow gamma k. That's what we're trying to prove. And the outline of the proof here, we make these assumptions. So basically we assume um, that, dear. Okay, we assume that the 2K part is false. In other words, we assume there is no 2K element subset of alpha beta uh, that is colored with one. We also assume the second part of the first one is false. Oh, sorry, the first part of the first one, the gamma one, we assume that is also false. Then our aim is to find a subset of alpha beta of order type omega beta. And this involves doing a very, very elaborate construction of a chain of sets, each of order type beta. And yes, the details here are really quite mind numbing. Here is, as I said, this is nearly a thousand lines of which I'm just showing you the beginning. Now, what I would like to point out though, and I think if you've looked at code from other proof assistants, um, except Mizar, you will have to admit that at least here, we can see a little structure. So at the first four lines are stating the theorem um, in fact, the weird word part n list actually is the name of the arrow notation. I think if I were less lazy, I could actually make it look like an arrow because we have arrows available to, to use in a notation. So the first four lines state the theorem and then the proof begins, of course, with the word proof. And the very first step, you can see a case analysis um, on basically the first case is the degenerate possibilities. So let's suppose either alpha is one or beta is zero because those are the degenerate cases. And that entire treatment appears on the slide. Then the false case, which begins at the very bottom of the slide, it, which is of course the non-degenerate non -degenerate case, which um, we run out of room for. But if you look at the degenerate case, you can see um, a bit of the argument. So if beta is zero, then the minimum of gamma and zero equals zero, and therefore it follows. Or in the, um, uh, there's the nested false case, that's when it turns out alpha is equal to one. You can see some work being done explicitly which leads to the conclusion, again, for the degenerate case only. And a point I would make about the, about the use of structured proofs is that you don't even have to trust the software. So I often get people saying, well, what if there's a bug somewhere? Now it is very carefully architected, but it's, you no, know, one could try to architect it in a stricter way. Um, you could ask about things like, I hear you define division by zero to equal zero, which is true. And you can freak out about that if you like. But what I would say here is if you are not sure, you can read the proof. The proof is written in infinitely more detail than any text. And, and your only danger of reading the proof is that you will die of boredom at seeing so many tiny little steps written out for you. However, if you don't die of boredom, you should at least be convinced that it's true because you can check for yourself that the chain of argument is actually reasonable. Okay, now equation eight was a little thing there's some of the things they throw out and it's just so annoying that it takes 
50 lines. I'm going to look at this again. Where would that go? Yeah, just kind of obvious. And no further explanation. I'm not even sure this was difficult. So my notes here say 50 lines of routine calculations. So it was perhaps obvious even to me, and yet an enormous amount of dotting of I's and crossing of T's was necessary to push this through. And given the length of that, I don't know whether any automation is going to do this sort of thing automatically in any reasonable time, now 10 years or whatever. Now, here's a funny thing. The, that thing was two lines. This thing is three lines. This is the main theorem of, of Milner and Erdos. And the main theorem is relatively easy because all the hard work was in the technical lemma we saw before. So bingo, the entire main theorem fits on the slide, you see? So you can look, you can see at the top, the theorem statement, you see we're doing induction. This is ordinary natural number, mathematical induction on N. We have the zero case, which is trivial. And then we have the successor case. Um, and I don't even this, I do not want to try and walk through, but nevertheless, it is at least digestible. And it's kind of funny that they went to so much detail on something that needed less work than the throwaway remarks in the middle of the proof. I guess it may be, and again, I, I don't want to disparage, disparage a genius, or maybe they feel because it's inductive, you need to say a little more, um, or maybe people just don't have a very clear idea as to how much work is in a remark, or more likely it is simply that some things are really intuitive and you know they're true, even though there is no simple argument as to why they're true, no simple precise argument. Okay, now that does it for um, Erdős and Milner. So what about Larson? So she published a proof of this result So this was originally published by Chang for M equals three. Milner generalized it to an arbitrary M. Um, and so Larson made a very much simpler, although still highly technical and difficult um, proof. And I have to say, um, with very few errors. In fact, I think I can say there are no significant errors in, their in her paper. I would say there are maybe two trivial ones. She included Specker's theorem as well, which is the omega squared, arrow omega squared M, to show her same approach in a simpler framework. But I won't, men I won't cover that here. Now, I want to say a few things about this. Once again, we're not going to see the technical details, which are mind blowing. Although I think having looked at the Erdos and Milner paper, I think that might've been even more mind blowing despite being a shorter paper. But and nevertheless, a few details might be interesting. So we are working with the ordinal omega to the omega the first thing she does is replace that by these. Firstly, you could replace them simply by sequences of natural numbers and work with those because they are the equivalent of omega to the omega. But it turns out she finds it simpler to work with increasing sequences of natural numbers. So this WN, it consists of N element increasing sequences of natural numbers. And for every set Wn, 
this set of increasing sequences has order type omega to the n under, I guess, the obvious lexicographic ordering. Take the union of all of those and you have the set of all finite increasing sequences. And this turns out to have order type omega to the omega. And this W will be the set that we work with for much of the time. And now the form of the theorem, what we then have to do to prove the theorem is we are given a function f that takes um, unordered pairs of w and colors them with two colors. Um, and then we assume that there is no m element set, which is one colored. And so we have to show that there is a set of order type omega to the omega, which is zero colored. So that is our objective. And then there's a vast, shall we say, a heap of constructions of which I will show you some, as I say, mainly to illustrate the technical difficulties because no one is going to understand the proof having seen this. So she defines things called interaction schemes. We've got two sequences. Remember W was increasing sequences, finite increasing sequences of natural numbers. The asterisks refer to concatenations. So we're taking X and Y and we're kind of segmenting them. So A1, A2 up to AK are themselves finite sequences, which you can see as segments of X, which when joined together um, form X. And possibly with that last segment, AK plus one stuck on the end. Y is always divided into just K segments. Then you define these other sequences such as C, which is composed of increasing lengths of the segment. So here we're measuring the accumulating lengths of these segments. And there are order constraints. I didn't mention this, but the idea is that we have A1, B1, A2, B2. So there is an interleaving of the A's and the B's based on their ordering so that if I go A1, B1, A2, B2, and so on, I am strictly increasing the natural numbers in my lists. And then she defines this. So this what she so-called interaction scheme of X and Y, which has this C, which is defined as above, then A1, then D, which is analogous to C, in fact, only for the Bs and so on, all these things stuck together. And the first thing you might ask is, um, how is this even well-defined? So how do I even know that given X and Y, there is a unique way of segmenting them so that everything is in order and that all these lengths fit together and that everything is all the ordering constraints are obeyed and so on. It turns out they are well-defined. I'm not sure, okay, I mentioned this. I'm not sure she ever says it in the paper. In other words, by introducing the notation, she implies that it's uniquely defined without saying it explicitly. So you have got to eventually figure out this is not going to make any sense unless I somehow prove that it is well-defined and the constraints I've given you are just barely enough to, to define the right-hand side uh, uniquely. Then it turns out it needs to be injective as well so that for every x and y, a, a distinct X and Y's, you get a distinct decomposition, which I suppose is a bit more obvious, but nevertheless, the proof is not easy. Um, we have this assumption. And there's one last thing just to show you 
those highlighted things, you see we have two cases, either the K plus one things are there or they're not there. So a further little complication is that everything has to be done twice depending on whether or not the K plus one guys are there. And again, I'm just giving you a flavor of the technical difficulties here. We need this along the way. Now I'm not even gonna sketch the proof just to state the Nash-Williams partition theorem, which is strictly a generalization of Ramsey's theorem in fact. So we have this, uh, and we're doing it here for W. This will be the same W as before, that is increasing finite sequences of natural numbers. So if I have a bunch of increasing sequences of natural numbers, I will call this set thin if no sequence is an initial segment of another one. Now, the simplest example of a thin set is when all the sequences have the same length. And in that case, it is exactly Ramsey's theorem. Otherwise, I don't even want to read through this in precise detail, but basically if I have a coloring of all of these sequence, of the, all these sequences of a particular thin set, then there is a, um, what do they call it? Monocolored partition, a monocolored um, subset um, as shown there, which I, again, believe it or not, I am, although I did this not so long ago, I don't really remember the technical details anymore, but I see, yes, it has to be infinite. And these are, by the way, when I say infinite here, these are going to be countable sets. And in fact, they're probably going to be, yes, they're sets of natural numbers. So this is just a slight generalization of the infinite Ramsey theorem. So we will need this along the way. Now, let me get back to Larson. So Larson proves three lemmas. Again, we don't need the details, but I think it's useful to see the style of the lemmas. So for the first one, I have a function on pairs of, um, on order pairs of elements of W. So pairs of increasing sequences of natural numbers. Um, and each such function, remember, is coloring these unordered pairs. So I'm using zero and one to represent colors. And the first lemma is giving us an infinite subset with a certain partition property. This again looks like, um, possibly another monocoloring property. The second one is taking an infinite set and giving us an M element set, as you can see. And the third one, uh, it's not necessary for me to read them. They are all relatively straightforward in the statements of these lemmas. The difficulty of proving them, I'm afraid, gets worse and worse. So, this one, this is where we use Nash-Williams and at 150 lines, I thought it wasn't bad actually. Um, so this was 900 lines. There are some awful constructions in here, which I will show you in a moment, which I think is why it took so long. And if one was doing this sort of proof on a regular basis, I think we could look for better ways of handling these inductive constructions. I also wasted a lot of time on this one because my eyesight isn't so good at age 65 and I overlooked a very crucial thing in the construction, but that is my fault. And this one was quite a dilly at 1700 lines. Part of this was an order type calculation, which probably was pretty obvious to Larson. Um, to me was a kind of scratch your head, maybe. So it took me a while to prove it. And here, maybe a few hints would have made this proof a lot shorter. Now, the full text 
of the main theorem is here. So that is the full proof. Um, I have to say the proofs of the lemmas were all too large to display. They went on, if I remember correctly, most of them were at least a full page or a page and a half. So this one is quite short and was only 150 lines. This was really not difficult. Um, and maybe it's time you will ask, why are your proofs so long? And um, in my experience, the level of detail, sorry, the level of detail in a proof um, is enormous. So I have done proofs by some other authors that were so detailed that I hardly had to write more than the author themselves. But that is the exception and not the rule. It's also clearly, I'm not an expert in any of this and I am struggling to prove things that perhaps were quite obvious to other people. Um, also, I think the lack well, I would say a combination of things. So certain things are truly obvious um, when, for example, a set is countable. Often you just say, yeah, of course it's countable. Um, it's obviously countable. And yet, you know, to actually give a precise argument it sometimes is not so easy. And combinatorial intuitions are even worse. If you think of even really easy claims about on the level of having a sack of red and blue balls and taking red, taking a ball out of the sack at random without replacement, very, very easy. And yet when you start formalizing that, you generally get in the, to the most terrible tangle. Now, again, maybe with more experience, we will do better at this. But finally, I think these proofs really are technically very difficult. So look, um, which lemma was this in? I think this was in the last lemma I showed you. Again, I'm not gonna go through it in detail, but you can see we're constructing sequences of sequences and sequences, and there's a whole bunch, wait a moment, this has got, oh no, this is actually the easy one. Ah, sorry, this is in the middle lemma. This is in the easier lemma. The only thing is I didn't look carefully at the right-hand side where they were going backwards, and I wasted probably a month's worth trying to figure out the proof because I'd read the definition wrong. But then the last lemma has an even more complicated thing where you have like whole families of sequences being defined. Um, I found this difficult to formalize. Now, no doubt someone more skilled or experienced will find a clever way to do this. But it was for my, for me, it was really a lot of effort to, to formalize these. And then proving even obvious properties often took fairly complicated inductions. Now, I wanted to mention some other work. So I haven't mentioned Alexandria yet. This is our nice EU funded project, which is hiring um, all my lovely postdocs, many of whom are here. I know people like um, Angela Key and uh, who did this work with me. Um, uh, Wenda, Wenda Lee is here, Anthony Borg and Janos. Um, anyway, we have done a lot of things and I don't want to go through all of them. We see Erdos turning up again. I do want to mention the last thing, the Grothendieck schemes at the bottom, because we just did it. We're very happy about it. This is Anthony Borg, Borg led this project. Um, and from what he tells me, we did it more quickly than the guys using a certain other system with less manpower and definitely with a lot less expertise because none of us know a lot about the growth and deke schemes. I in particular know zero about them. 
So we are quite optimistic as to what we can do. And what we're trying to do in looking at all these different kinds of mathematics is if you'd like explore the space, identify difficulties, and just try to, you know, develop methodologies. And we think we have a quite general methodology for dealing with abstract things like Groth and Deke schemes, which in fact I haven't covered at all in this talk. So the, the methodology I'm hinting at here will be the subject for another talk altogether. Um, what about the future? We are definitely going to get some very big libraries. We are working on very powerful search tools. So I mentioned among my postdocs, Janos in particular is not proving theorems. He's working on things like search and that also is a very important thing. By search, I mean the ability to find stuff proved by other people stuff, theorems that you think are already available, but you don't know their name or exactly how they're formulated. And you want to find them when you've got, you know, a hundred thousand theorems in a, in a library. That should be possible. I think that verification of stupid things will be increasingly possible and might, and will be more and more automatic. Now, counterexamples. I didn't mention in the talk, though I could have, the big proof by Larson involves finite sequences a lot, and this is a computational type for which, for some of the things we were trying to prove, we can benefit from Isabel's counterexample finder. So we can state certain things we want to prove and ask Isabel, though, are there counterexamples? And it can say there certainly are. And this is an immense time saver compared with trying to prove a thing which isn't even true. So that's a thing we can do even now. As for the future, so I'm getting more and more speculative here. The idea that your system could notice that the thing you're trying to prove looks an awful lot like a thing that has been proved already and maybe point you to that other proof or maybe automatically suggest things taken from the other proof. I think this will become feasible. As for this, um, I think, so here I'm talking about, perhaps through machine learning, the beginnings of some kind of mathematical common sense. So the idea that the thing you're trying to prove, your function f surely needs to be continuous there, doesn't it? Or maybe it even needs to be differentiable. You forgot to state that, or the set needs to be compact. And once again, it's quite important to find these gaps because if you have missed out something, then your automation doesn't have a chance. You know, we have quite powerful automation that can fill a lot of gaps, but you need to have all the prerequisites there. So what we are aiming for, I think, is to create an assistant, an assistant who is very pedantic and will be more and more intelligent. And I think I'd better stop here. I didn't notice any questions, by the way, but I wasn't very alert. Uh, Are there any? Yes, please. Uh, questions from the audience? OK. Yeah, so I'd like to ask a question. Yeah. So uh, Larry, can you say something about yeah. uh, the automation that you used to prove the partition theorems and uh, and the automation that you didn't use, but you, you suspect might, might have been helpful? Well, I think I used everything in Isabel. So in particular, um, so there's a thing called Sledgehammer, which calls external theorem provers. I rely on that mostly because very often, 
I'll be honest with you, I don't know what you're doing. Um, Sledgehammer is great when you don't know what you're doing, but when the thing you're trying to prove is not very far away, it will find the proof. Um, if you can't do it with Sledgehammer, then one has to use you know, the other tools like rewriting and so on. And as I mentioned here, I actually needed a counterexample finding because there was annoyingly a really a part of the proof that Larson didn't state at all because it really is obvious um, in an intuitive way, but I would think it took me maybe two weeks and that included finding a way of going about even approaching proving the thing. So one approach I tried, struggled with for a week or more and finally gave up on. And I can again, thank counterexample finding that I knew to give up on it and then tried a quite different approach for again, proving a thing that's pretty obvious, which is basically when you've got two lists of non-overlapping elements about how you kind of merge the things together in order. See? So I, I noticed a couple of calls to Mason along the way. Uh, were those, were yeah. those the, the result of a sledgehammer call or were they called oh, by yeah. hand? When, when... No, they all come from sledgehammer. And of course the proofs, the full proofs are downloadable. Yeah. I uh... Uh, just to maybe expand on Jeremy's question and then one more question. So uh, uh, when you, so, so as, as an experienced user, so you, you use, for example, a sledgehammer, to what extent did you have a, do you have a good sense? Uh, here's, here's something I need to prove. Sledgehammer will work, you know, that you, you guess it will work before you try it versus, uh, you know, you know not, not knowing and just having to try it. Is it something that um, you have an intuition for? I guess you have to not expect the impossible. So if there's a thing and you think, well, it's an order type argument and I'm gonna to have to use this function connected with the order type that maps the set to the ordinal and I'm gonna to have to take an inverse image and make another set and blah, blah, blah and show something as bijective. And I think when it's those things, you're going to sketch out the skeleton of the proof knowing all this stuff that has to be done and knowing it's not going to do any of these creative steps, whatever. But when it comes to the easy stuff, like you think, yes, of course, it's a bijection because it came from this thing. Then you click on Sledgehammer where you expect it really ought to be obvious. Then you let Sledgehammer do it. And the only other intuition is if it has a lot of variable binding in it, then you don't try sledgehammer because it doesn't come. Right, 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 right. Well. So, so, so I was just asking for your your empirical. You know, so, so, so these are useful, you know, useful advice for people. And now, have it know, knowing and internalizing all this, do you usually have the right intuition as to whether it will do something in practice in, in this particular proof? Is it did, you know eighty percent, ninety percent of the time you were able? To... Well, I don't need to. You see, um. You can be lazy, it's just a, a mouse click. So yeah. why think, you see what you've got to do and especially at, at my age is give your brain a rest. I often do this stuff in the evening. So I like the hard work of like teaching students and all this stuff takes place during the day. And for at least for easier proofs, it's even a matter of relaxation to go and say, oh, I'll work on this a little bit. Um, I've got this thing because some of the steps, the routine steps don't need a lot of thought. And then instead of trying to put together some elaborate proof, then you're just clicking on the button. And yeah, yeah, that that's right. It. It's, it's, it's a question that may or may not come to mind. I was, I was curious, more or less as a sense of, you know, is, is oh, it the other thing? One? Yeah. There's another thing and it's really quite important. It's the interplay between sledgehammer and structured proofs. So, Quite often you can think of an intermediate lemma that would help. I shouldn't say lemma, more like an intermediate factor, an intermediate step. And because it's a structured proof, you can just write that step explicitly, write out the thing you want. And if you're lucky, 
it will be halfway between the, your started and your main result. Sledgehammer might do that, or it might do the second half. Oh. And if it still doesn't, you can keep subdividing until they're all really oh. trivial. Oh. Oh. And here it requires almost no thought. And you might get a proof that's longer than it could be, but it, at least it's a proof. Um, Okay. Uh, and so how many, how many man weeks did the project you just described, the set theory project take and you roughly? Oh dear. 10, five. I five, would five. guess it was January to August, 2020 approximately. And just you or with help or? Well, I had the help of Angeliki and Myrna um, so I often discuss things with them, but the actual proofs, so I did the proofs, certainly. We discussed the material and we exchanged ideas. Um, but yeah, I wrote the proofs. Right. Right. And then this wasn't your full time. I'm actually, I should say, I'm grateful to Myrna for suggesting the whole domain. So I know as I said, nothing about this. She thought it was a really appropriate problem domain and it has turned out to be interesting. It's, some people would say too far from mainstream mathematics, but I think anything with Erdős's name on it can't be too far. Okay, I, I have one more, but let me again open to the audience. Are there more questions from the audience? Uh, I have a question. Please. Um, Going back to the foundations, as I understand, you're not using Isabel ZF, but some sort of uh, Correct. system of axioms. So is it sort of like uh, Mike Gordon's system where he adds a universe to whole? Um, Mike Gordon did a similar thing where he added the ZF axioms to higher logic. And somebody else using Isabel made a thing called Hall ZF, adding probably the same axioms. So when I did it again, and I think someone proved my formalization is mathematically identical to those. Um, there are certain advantages in the way I did it. So if you like, I, I would claim my approach is more elegant in the way that it integrates set theory with the existing higher order logic, but from a purely logical point of view, they are identical systems. Are, are there issues about having functions in higher order logic and then functions in set theory and going back and forth? Um, do I use any functions in set theory? I didn't think I do. Even Isabel ZF has what might be called meta-level functions or what you might call class functions, like the power set operator would be a class function. And that also, in fact, works in higher order logic where higher order logic functions are can be class functions. So we have a type V, which is the ZF universe, and a function from type V, arrow V, is something like power set would be a, a class function. But a function in ZF would be, I guess, a set of pairs in ZF. We wouldn't use that very often. I see. So you stay more on the uh, higher order logic side. Oh yeah, I try and live in higher order logic as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Thank you. More questions? Um, if not, let me throw out my last, and it's, it's a really very open-ended question, but uh, let's see. So uh, I, I, I think one can make the case, although it, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy, it takes time to write these uh, proofs, but that the, 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 the real, if how, how I should say, uh, point where it, it will make people, the, the, it's secondary compared to the ability to uh, Reuse the proofs and to, to to use them to prove other statements and it, you know so the you know the basic observation would be that uh, there's just in principle you know a, a lot of people that are willing to uh, do labor and uh, vast projects have been done by crowdsourcing in cases where it's not skilled labor now of course this is requires quite a bit of skill and practice but but nevertheless if one can prove you know a sufficient set of theorems and set theory such that uh, 
a lot of the subject is covered and everybody can just reuse them, right? Then uh, one can, can say that, you know, yes, the machine knows set knows the basics of set theory, and now now we can you know prove things at a research level. And to the extent that one can't reuse things, you know, then of course if one winds up reusing and you know, you're having to reprove and, and do the work over and over again. And so, you know, that, that could be argued to be the crucial point. And of course, some of the things on your last slide address that directly, such as the search engine. Clearly, if you can't find something, you can't reuse it. And if people can find it, then they can <clears throat> they can reuse it. But there, of course, there are other obstacles to reuse. And I, I wonder if you might, might comment on, on work that could uh, improve that situation. Um, this brings to mind a thing that's always puzzled me about type theory systems that I see a lot of rebuilding of libraries and I'm not exactly sure why they do it so much. Uh, and I'm not an expert on type theory, of course. I just have the impression that a library gets built and used for an example and thrown away and then a new one is built and they might even say well the old one wasn't very good but then when you get on to the third and then maybe even the fourth you start to think there's something not right here now in the case of isabel so isabel has a big analysis library based on these type classes i mentioned now type classes, although we have very impressive examples of reuse, um, I think probably Jeremy's central limit theorem builds on a very big hierarchy of pre previous developments. And we have a nice little, um, when you visit a theory, you can visit the whole hierarchy. You can get a nice graphical diagram. And for some of these developments, these hierarchies are really huge. Um, like depending, I don't maybe a hundred things or more of a hundred really big theories. So we are already seeing very substantial reuse of some theories. Nevertheless, uh, I think the complaint can be made about the analysis library that because it was largely ripped off from the Hall Light analysis library, um, and which is in case of Hall Light, it is literally about Rn, where n isn't even really a natural number. And we generalized it very slightly, but it's not really flexible enough. And some people have complained that the way things were done in the analysis library is not flexible enough to go a level above. So it looks like, and of course it would be a big job to do in full, but it looks like we need further experiments in doing things in the more abstract way I alluded to, to uh, have a more flexible environment for building on top of things. But even so, we're not going through one library after another. Okay. Uh yeah, so that, that that's helpful. And, and let me just you know throw out just a, a thought. I mean, a lot of progress in computer science comes when we have uh, benchmarks and quantify progress. And perhaps there is some way of producing some way to quantify or benchmark this question of to what extent can one uh, reuse a, uh, you know, a a library. Uh, are there are there are there more more questions from the audience or? If, 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 if not, uh, let's uh, all thank uh, Larry for a you know, very uh, stimulating talk. And uh, we'll uh, close the uh, seminar. Uh, next week, we'll have uh, David McAllister, who will speak about uh, type theory from the point of view of artificial intelligence. And so I hope to see you all there. Thanks for the talk, and thanks for attending. Thank you very much. So long. Well, thank you. That was, I think that worked okay. My network yes. didn't die, which is yes. a major no, fear of no, mine. No technical problems. It was definitely an interesting talk. And, uh, yeah, well, I, I, I know if you would like the slides.
Do you put uh, the yes, slides yes, on the will, Yes, yes, yes. If you send me the slides, we will put them up along with the video. Yes. Okay. Great. Let me stop here.